So is this being webcast? Yeah. And are you able to see us clearly? That means you have to tell Akul to also stand at this particular place, right? Like, sure. Is it working okay? Yes, sir. All right. So good evening to everybody in this room and also those of us who are on the internet world online. Welcome to this fine and to this space. I have great joy in introducing uh, Atul to you. Atul Khosla is uh, Senior VP Global Head of Talent and Leadership Development in Chicago for Montelis Worldwide. And I've known Atul from the time we inducted him from campus from uh, the MBA program in Punjab University in Chandigarh when he joined Aisha and he was a colleague in Aisha for the first seven years. And it's been wonderful and amazing to see how Atul has taken responsibility. What I remember about him as a young professional is that he built a connection from the heart with people. So when he was in the plant, and this is something very important in HR, you earn the trust of people because you really care for them. You don't do it as a job. You should really love people and connect with people. So if there's an employee who has a problem, it should bother you. You should not go to sleep that night till you do something about it. That is HR, and I think Atul was one of those people. He now remembers that we had a colleague there called Dev Sharma, who incidentally works with him in Montelis globally. Dev was a machine operator in the Parvanu factory, right? But he had the desire to do something with his life. And his colleagues noticed that, so they encouraged him to study further. He studied further, he did his graduation first through correspondence, then he applied for an MBA to Pune, got selected, the company gave him study leaves. And then Dave is now one of the senior leaders, he's one of the VPs in human resources in Mondelez Global, from a machine operator to a senior leader. All because there were colleagues there in the system, somebody who cared that here is a person who operates the machine who has dreams and that you could put oxygen on his dreams and sometimes when you put oxygen on people's dreams wonderful things happen so we were in a company and we noticed that Abu genuinely cared and he had the presence of mind and he also then was willing to take responsibility that's what you expect people like right? you care but then you are willing to take full responsibility we saw that uh, at a young age in Akul and you know, no wonder that uh, he was just telling us that you know young people who are entering the workforce today, you cannot promise them any careers, but you can certainly promise them experiences. Rest is up to you to take charge of your own lives. Right? So I don't, won't say more because you have read his resume, you've gone through senior leadership roles in different geographies all over the world. And it's such a joy for me at uh, this stage of my life when I see some young colleagues of mine who started a career and to see them flower and make a mark all over the world, I, for me that is the biggest celebration and to say, I think it was wonderful to start careers together and to learn from each other. So thank you, Rahul, and thank you for coming to Soil. And now I will leave you with the students and sit at the back and enjoy the dialogue. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Flying back to Chicago this night, and I was passing through Delhi. I made a point that um, Anil has been talking about it, so that I, I should come with and talk to the students. So I'm so glad it's happening today. Uh, I'll probably start with a brief introduction uh, who I am, what I do, and then I'll be very happy to share uh, my stories, of course. But any questions you may have, anything to do with the career, uh, jobs or anything else which you think I can be of any help to you or offer some perspective, so we'll be happy to do that. So I uh, grew up in Chandigarh, which is my hometown, so born brought up there in my education, did my master's from uh, University Business School, which was called CBM at that time, Commerce and Business Management firm. And I was selected uh, by Anil and the Aisha team to be an IR officer in a tractor factory in Parwan, in Himachal. So that's where I start my journey. 
And I was just sharing with them, you know, sometimes people ask you in different forums, you know, how much uh, role did the luck play in the breaks you got in your career? And I genuinely believe that my biggest uh, kind of luck break was that I got to start my career with a company like Aisha, which helped me to build uh, a character which stayed with me even today, or which is helping me to make choices which I made. Uh, I worked around seven years uh, with Aisha in two different locations, and then I joined PepsiCo here in India. Pepsi was just coming in at that time, so one of those new multinationals, and I was, uh, you know, impressed by getting into a broader global kind of platform. So I worked uh, seven years with PepsiCo here in India, different locations. So I was uh, based in Gurgaon, in Punjab. Uh, on the same factories in Lucknow and UP and then in Chennai. When I was uh, offered a role out of Singapore by the Wars. And how did that happen? I was working here in India. Uh, someone who used to be uh, the global talent lead for uh, PepsiCo at that time, some in a role which I'm doing today, he moved to Novartis. And Novartis was looking for a head of HR for the Asia region. I was based in India. He recommended to the Novartis folks that there's a guy out there who should go and reach out. So I, I was just working here to get a call from someone that we got a reference from a guy, this guy called Neil Anthony. That there's a role for you and would you be interested? And I gave an interview. But I want to highlight this that that was one of those things where I never knew that there's an opportunity with the company. But there was this guy who saw from a distance what I was doing and felt confident enough or comfortable enough to recommend me to a company for a role which I had never done in the past. So I moved to Singapore, I did uh, regional growth for two and a half years. And then I uh, was offered a role in Switzerland to be head of HR for Novartis for Europe, Middle East, and Africa region, which was one of the biggest, I would say, change or transition challenges I personally went through. I did that role very successfully for a couple of years. And then I had to move back to India, so I came in in 2006. Uh, my mother, who was with me uh, in Switzerland, had her health uh, challenges, so she wanted to come back to India. So I came here and took a role with HL as a head of HR. Uh, but I lost my mom in like three weeks time after coming to India, so and we had a son who was born since like two years old. He struggled to adjust coming in here. And my role was still open with the water, so they came back and they came to know about my mom that would you like to come back to Switzerland? Your role is still open. So I went back after uh, four and a half, five months. Then I did a global role with Novartis uh, out of Atlanta, Georgia in the US. I was heading HR for a small IT business, very successful company called Siva Vision. I did that for around four years. And there was an opportunity with the uh, combined group of Novartis for the Asia based on Singapore. And I did that. Came to Singapore and was headhunted by a company called Kraft, which became uh, one list. So I did uh, five years in two regional roles, one as Asia Pack, and I had a major for Asia Pack, and then we merged Middle East Africa and Asia Pack to make EMEA region, so I was getting HR for EMEA till last July. Then I was offered a role in the US as a global head of talent, so I'm now based in Chicago. Uh, I'm there with my wife, Sumati, she's from Kashmir, uh, one daughter there, and she's a homemaker, and uh, we have a son was uh, going to be 15 um, in September. So that's uh, kind of a bit of my background. I can share with you probably a couple of stories and then I want to open up unless you don't know about you. So feel free to ask questions which are relevant to you. So I think two things. One, I want to build on what Anil started, the story of Dave. That a lot of admiration for Dave. He's a uh, head of HR for us uh, in India and Southeast Asia. Uh, looking after all uh, ISC integrated supply chain including manufacturing plants. So when I joined or started my career uh, as IR officer in this tractor factory, we had a uh, CITU or a CPM union, very aggressive union at that plant. Anil would remember that. And Dave was the vice president of that union. 
and we used to have very uh, heated conversations from everything from a rotten food to self and canteen to any problems you know somebody wanted to eat and get it and one day there was a accident of the bus which was carrying our employees back home after the shift so from Palwan to Kalka, those of you who are familiar with that part of the, the geography, it's like a 30 kilometers, 25 kilometers bus line. And this bus overturned. And I was, companies at that time used to have yet three motorbikes. I don't know if you saw what they were. So I was on that motorbike rushing to this place when we got a call that there was an accident. Dave came to me and said, Can I ride with you? Uh, because we're driving there. And we had a conversation in that motorbike ride where I got to know this guy. So he started sharing with me about what he does. So one thing he said that in my free time, I'm pursuing graduation with the ITI. He said, I'm, I'm pursuing graduation by correspondence. And I teach the children of our factory workers uh, in the evening or after the end of the shift. And I, I was really intact. I used to hate this guy because he would come and shout at me and do all kind of stuff. You know, the typical job of us <coughs> standard union leader. And I was really taken aback that this guy is investing in himself, studying in the evening, and then helping the children of other workmen. And we started chatting, and then after that, he would just come to have a chat and conversation. And one day he said, You know, I would like. I would like to be like you. I would like to go to a good institute and you know study and do something. Aisha at that time had a program which would pick up some of the employees and sponsor them for higher education. So I represented him to Anil and the leadership of Aisha at that time. That is a guy who genuinely wants to grow can be helped. And he went and did his uh, MBA from Symbiosis. So he got selected because he worked hard. He got selected and then he got sponsored. So one week after he joined there, I came home. So I used to take a bus from Chandigarh to go to the factory. I came home and I saw Dave sitting in my home with my mother. And my mom was trying to console him. The guy was in tears. And I said, What happened? And he said, I can't, I cannot go there, I can't speak English. These are kids from very uh, you know, well-known families. I can't communicate, I can't stand up in that room. I don't belong to that place. And he was trying to tell my mom, who should tell me that it's okay. I and mean, let him come back and not go there. So we spent time, had a very open conversation. And then eventually he agreed that he would go there. We used to call those without mobile phones and all that. So we used to fix a time when we will do a trunk call to each other every week just to give him that confidence. And as Anil said earlier, I mean, it feels hard to try how this guy took control of his own development growth. He was heading, I stayed in touch with him, although I moved out of India just to follow what he was doing. He was heading HR for PepsiCo here in India in integrated supply chain when I had opening in my organization when I was in the region and I, I brought him in. And last year he completed his master's. So he continued studying, no, not master's, sorry, his doctorate in human resource management. He's now Dr. Dev Sharma, by the way. And it gives me so much pride to see a guy who took upon himself. He's, he's from a small little village called Mandana. I've been to his village too. You can't imagine how a person from those humble roots made a life of his own, took control of his life and continued to grow and continues to grow even now. I mean, he just pursued and completed his doctorate recently. So one big incident. The other one, another story I want to relate to you and then I'll open up for the questions. You know, when my biggest, as I was saying, my biggest personal challenge has been multiple roles, multiple locations. Was when I was offered a role in Europe to head HR for Vox. And honestly, I didn't know why did they offer that role to me. I was two years in the company. They saw something, and out of the blue, they came and told me, oh, there's an opening, would you like to consider that? 
Before I could decide, my wife and everybody in the family, they wanted to go to Switzerland. I think everybody had seen Switzerland in the movies. So they got excited. It's a great opportunity. We should go there. And I went there. And I remember my first meeting with my team. So I had my heads of HR from uh, you know, Germany, UK, Spain, Italy, all in the room. I called them over for a first introductory meeting. And I was telling or talking to them, introducing myself, setting up the agenda, you know, what we need to do, this is our strategy, direction, whatever. And I lost them in five minutes, flat. I mean, they were looking outside. There's a lot to look outside in Switzerland, but if you're a you don't want to listen to a whole conversation. And they were not connecting with me. I'm completely disconnect in that room it was very, very uncomfortable. And these are folks who were very experienced. They were 20 years, 25 years, heading HR for this big uh, European healthcare company. Probably some of them aspired to be in the role where I was getting into. And they could never figure out this Indian guy who was two years at the company, just moved two and a half years out uh, back from India. Trying to tell them how to run a function. So it was a very, very difficult moment for me. So I had a, had a wife who moved with me who was expecting our son. I had a mother who was paralyzed and I was very keen to bring her with me to Switzerland. And there were days I used to just think, did I do the right thing by taking a role and putting me and my family at risk of going to a new place so far away from my home? And I went to my head of global head of HR, what's a guy called Simon Nash at that time. I still am in touch with him. He's retired now. So I said, Anil, uh, is there an opportunity to move back to Singapore, the Asia? After two or three months. And he said, why? So I said, well, I don't think I am in a position to lead these people. They have their own minds, they are very smart people, and I have nothing, nothing against them. But I don't think I will be ever able to get respect to this team. They don't look at me as someone who can provide them the leadership they need. So it's a lose-lose. They they're not going to get what they are looking for. And I'm getting frustrated being in a role where I can't contribute and cannot add value. So Simon said first, well, there's, there's an opportunity. We are a big company. So if you want to go back to India or you want to go back to Asia, you can. That's not a big deal. But a big deal is that you have a lifelike opportunity to learn something. And you're just squandering it. You're ready to let it go. Because you may not get another opportunity to work in an environment which you are not comfortable in. And you have to find your way through. So make a call. You want to go today, we'll find out, find a way to help you. You want to live through it, it's it's a heat of change. So if you can handle heat for some more time, give it a shot. Maybe there is something better at the end of it, the other end of it. And then he also, by the way, coached me on other things, but this is something which really stuck in my head. So, well, I've already made this move now. Everybody's here. I have nothing to lose. And he took that pressure off me that I didn't have to think of, well, but where do I go from here? So he said there would be an opportunity to go back. So I figured out that in Europe, people don't just take you because you have a position or you have a role, or you are a head of one of the HR. They need to, you need to earn their trust. They need to understand what you bring on the table. So the first thing I did by the way in that transition was to tell them that I don't know what I don't know. So instead of telling them and showing them my standard tool, toolkit of this is how you want to lead HR versus dropping my guard and admitting that I don't know what I don't know and I got to learn from you. So I, I traveled extensively, a very tough phase by the way, a sick mom, a wife who just delivered a baby. I was on the road for almost 20, 25 days, putting myself in those countries, in their offices, observing them what they were doing and learning from them. So their biggest issue was, I don't know anything about Europe. And I said, well, that's a that's fact. I don't know anything about Europe, but I want to learn. So I, I want to be with you and I want to learn from you. And then I observed and then I started adding my perspective to what they were doing. 
which they didn't have. So I was coming from emerging markets. I had some unique experiences which I was able to build down to their expertise. And eventually, that's a team which I'm so proud of today, because that's the best team I've ever worked with. If I go to Switzerland today, I go very often because we have a Rondelis regional headquarters in Zurich. No matter where they are, people will come and see me. We'll have a dinner together, we'll have a drink together. There are people who would actually visit us in Singapore because they wanted to have a conversation or a discussion with me. And I'm so proud of that set of people who have all grown and are bigger goals. So one of the learnings which started with me is it's very easy to drop and walk away. But you've got to really build that comfort to live through that kind of change. And build relationships which are based on character, based on a long-term interdependence than just the title of the movie, which go a long way. So that's probably it. I'm not going to bore you with more, more such stuff. But any questions or anything you'd like to ask or know, I'm happy to answer. And please take the microphone and uh, introduce yourself, uh, share your name, and then ask the question. So, uh, first of all, uh, it's great to see you here and uh, looking at the work experience which you have and the stories which you just spoke. I just want to ask you that, like, since uh, you know, switching from pharmaceutical industry to the chocolate industry, beverages in industry, so, like, what, uh, what are your feelings about that? Like, how do you change yourself, or is it like something new which you have to bring up to the table to, you know, define your role and obviously mixing up a new set of people in different locations. And would so, you share your name please? So my name is Arjit and uh, I'm from the marketing cohort and research is something which I'm trying to you know, go through and I'm trying to know that what exactly type of products which people, uh, different companies launch looking at different regions. So we just want to understand that like from you like how is your experience in the industry? Yeah. That is something which I've been also doing, so I just want to understand that. <laughs> so, great question, Archit. I think uh, I'll give answer in two parts. The first part is that uh, we have in HR a little bit of an advantage. Uh, how many of you are HR students? So, okay, great. So, there's a little bit of an advantage that we are giving people. So it's a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit industry agnostic. So, you can move around uh, you know, from one industry to another. I think more importantly, you can't uh, be an effective HR leader if you don't understand business. So you just cannot go and apply you know, lift and shift tools from one place to another place. You've got to really deeply understand the business, business strategy, business agenda, then align your people and organization strategy or co build co create your people and organization strategy with that. So uh, you are right, I moved around industries, but I think every uh, move gave me. Uh, incredible opportunity to learn something new about a new business, you know, from making, uh, you know, contact lens to making a candy bar or a chocolate, they are completely different ball games. And the consumer profile and what does it take for people to really get attracted to, you know, take a sip of Pepsi versus take a sip of Coke. It, it does give you a very different perspective, a different opportunity. So I enjoy being out there in the markets. I did a, did a lot of that stuff to we out there in the factory, we out there in the market. Every role I've moved in, invest yourself to understand and learn the business. Then you, you can offer effective HR solutions. But if you get threatened by that, then you will hold back because you develop a comfort. You know, I'm in the financial sector, I do meet people in HR. I'm an expert in financial sector, right? I want to do FMCG. In the end, you are just losing out on an opportunity to learn something incredibly new and different. <laughs> Uh, very good evening, sir. My name is Saman, and uh, I was working with Montes India as sales executive. So I, I have not much experience. I have just eight to nine months of experience in Montes, and then I changed my background from sales to human resource. So if you can give me your regular advice in changing your uh, domain from sales to human resource, so how I can go further to build up a good career in human resource. 
Especially I've seen in my own career people who worked in sales or marketing or manufacturing and have come to HR being much more effective leaders. And why I say that is that when you are you know you're in touch with the consumers and customers, you are much better understanding of what are the business drivers, what does what does it take to really make an impact or make sure that your consumer demand, your consumer expectations are met. So I mean I want to go back to my Pepsi days. Anyone here work for Pepsi? So Pepsi days long time back, we used to put us in a truck. So I was heading HR for South uh, Market Unit based on Chennai. Two days in a month, we used to go in a truck and sell Pepsi. And I was an HR guy. It took me some time to figure out why the hell should I be sitting in a cab and it's quite humid and hot in Chennai, as you know, to go and sell Pepsi. And actually, it was not just doing a route ride with somebody supervising or overseeing, but actually selling this of Pepsi. And it, it will get recorded in our performance development review or PDR as they call it. 24 days of the <coughs> sat outside. And the whole idea was that you really start developing the appreciation of what these people do. So our front line, people are going and selling and distributing our products. I had a much better understanding of what they do, you know, even to the fact that we used to give them thicker uniforms <coughs> in a very humid and they will go from their buttons up to here. And we change that to t-shirts. So a lot of those things which you will only learn when you are there with them. So a lot of frontline training programs we develop, which would have these simplified tools on which they usually make notes. So we used to give them some standard American templates of going to a shop and seeing merchandising make a record. They didn't know how to read and write that, which was a pain for them. So we simplified all that stuff. So I truly believe, by the way, with your experiences are money. What you bring on the table is slightly different or unique to a standard HR uh, you know, uh, leader. So you have it's up to you how you want to leverage those capabilities, insights, and skills which you picked up as a sales leader in developing people's solutions. Yeah. Yes. Please give us the microphone. <laughs> Thank you for stopping by. My name is Radhika Kapoor and I am from Human Resource Leadership Cohort here. Yeah. Uh, so I would like to ask you that as today the times are changing and some of the best practices of the industry talk about HR in terms of change champions and being more strategic partners. And HR is known for measuring employees based on their competence. So according to your experience, and learnings. Could you please let us know how we as HR professionals, uh, what are those competencies that we should build on to be better future HR professionals? Great, great question. Alka. So maybe let me think of process. What's the best way to address that? So I'll come to what you need. I'll come to that. First, I'll talk about what is changing in the industry. I think that'll be relevant not only for HR but for everybody. And I was talking to your teachers uh, just like 20 minutes back. <coughs> I think one of the bigger shifts which is happening in the organizations is that organizations are not static anymore. The change is much quicker, much more quicker than it used to be, probably five or ten years back. So the structures, the designs, the way organizations are positioned are changing because organizations are much more nimble and agile now to adapt to what consumers or customers want. So if the preferences are shifting, so speed to market, I'll give you my own industry example, is very critical. So organizations which were very vertically structured, mm -hmm. have research centers globally, which are thinking about the new generation, whatever uh, preferences on links. The, the gestation of that insight into creating a commercial product was eight or nine months. So when you get an insight that, okay, consumer wants, I don't know, a burnt caramel flavor in China. By the time you develop a product, it will be eight to nine months. It will get consolidated without people working. Now, 
you want to respond very quickly if you don't do somebody else will do it. So organizations are just evolving very, very quickly. Making sure that you are looking at a very dynamic environment and not you know hanging on to the structure which we when we grew up in my own career, you could almost position that you are a factory IR executive, you can be a factory HR manager, then you can be a regional HR person, then you can be a country HR director. That structure is not uh, existing anymore, changing very fast. So my advice to you all is look for experiences, don't look for career or position for which you want. So if you are getting experiences which will stay relevant, no matter what structure is there, Organizations will need people to run the organization. So make sure that you're getting the right level of experiences. You're not, you know, a lot of times, by the way, again in HR and ICT, people don't want to go to the factories. They want to go to the corporate office or headquarters or whatever. <coughs> the reality is that those experiences, in terms of demand and supply, are much more abundant than what is needed. And it's not rounding you off with what you need to build the skill sets or portfolio of skill sets which will stay relevant for a longer term. So career is a long haul by the way. It's not a two year, three year, five year game. You want to look at how you want to shape it with the right amount of investments during and answering, which will get you the outcome, the results you want. So keep that in mind. Now coming back to your very specific question, what do, what do we need to be effective or successful HR people? And I will broaden it by the way, I'll take it beyond HR. Uh, having been in the people stroke talent stroke HR space for the last so many years across the world, working in Europe, US, here in Asia. Three, three things stick to me. One is capabilities. Make sure you have the right capabilities. So upgrade your portfolio. Uh, you know, when I joined, there were no computers at the heat of it. I used to do a payroll in the factory funnel on a calculator for 300 people. So every month, 300 employees, you do a payroll on a 13-column sheet, and then you work backwards to make sure that you don't commit a mistake. And that was hard because you come after doing your MBA thinking you're going to get into a space which is to be more exciting. This was not exciting, but this is an investment you made to go through that experience which stays with you. And also you develop an appreciation for what others do, you know, when you are sitting at different levels. I know exactly what it takes to do payroll in a factory. When you've got to really make sure that everybody gets paid on time in the right way. So, but now you have new skills, right? You've got to move on. We are now implementing workday. My team is across the globe. We have 90,000 employees. We are transitioning them to a self-service platform. It's a huge change. And before I could land that change to the organization, I'm learning myself what would it Feel like I was actually with Workday uh, a few weeks back and I asked them to walk me through if I'm an employee what would that experience look like so they organized a one full day session to make me comfortable as an employee before I decide what transition you want to make so make sure your capabilities are upgrading from time to time two I would say capacity uh, be prepared to work hard there are no shortcuts if you are thinking, you know, you can do stuff very quickly, it's not sustainable. Sometimes you get some good breaks, and a lot of people have seen get good breaks. It's not sustainable. So personal capacity, which includes capacity as components like capacity to learn, investing your time, investing your focus, keeping your uh, eyes open when you see something, observing with intent, not observing like a movie, but you know what stays with you. What are you taking away from that? And third, I say character. I, I truly believe if you have a, a very deep foundation, it kind of stays with you. It takes you through. I, I was giving this year example to you. One of the biggest learning in my life is people connect with your character. They don't connect with your titles, your roles, what you do, how you do, no matter which part of the world you are. They want to see who you are as a person. And one, you should be a good human being, and two, you should be able to convey to the other person that you're a good human. So that's an important piece. A little kind of foundation is courage. So when you get an opportunity, lean in. A lot of times we over-process, we overthink. Should I do it? What would it take? Is it convenient? Is it a good place to go? 
when you get an opportunity, your instinct tells you that this is something I should try out. It's better to lean in than lean out. But understanding the business is very really critical. I truly believe you've got to really understand the business strategy, business drivers, where the business is heading before engaging the employees. Of course, you engage the employees, your business is going to do well. If you have an engaged workforce, they really know what to do, they are clear about what are the outcomes you're trying to drive. You create an environment where they feel value added, they feel growing. Then your business has every opportunity to because you know, uh, I mean, a chocolate is a chocolate, everybody's selling it. There's some part, some organization which do well than the others because you have people who are very clear in terms of what is expected. So, as HR, I think our responsibility is to really create the right environment where we can attract, develop, and grow the right level of talent. People want to be part of your organization, they want to grow with your company, they can come for a long haul. But just before jumping into that, that we are you know, we are the conscience keepers or people who will take care of other people. You've got to really understand what are the business drivers. What in the service of what we are trying to engage people and get them excited about that journey. And then the outcomes will be there. Yes. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to you. So, uh, the things that you mentioned first, please. Uh, my name is Faraz. Uh, so one of the things that you mentioned that uh, you need to convey to the people you're working with and the customers that you're a good person. So how do you do that in a corporate manner? That's a great question. I don't think you do anything special to be who you are. So my sense is don't try to be who you are not. Let me put it in that. So sometimes when I see people really work hard to present themselves to be almost perfect, and the reality is that it's again gets figured out very quickly. And I go back to my example I was sharing with us about my Europe days. I did everything I had in my back pocket of trying to look impressive. I know this and I have done this and I've done that, telling them my stories, trying to convince or impress them that I've got something which they don't have. And the reality is that it doesn't work and it didn't work for me too. You got to really tell people who you are. If you come across as I went and told them, I don't know what you know. I'm willing to learn from you. People appreciate that, they connect with that. So when I was talking about character, that was the context I was saying. Don't try to be who you are not. Don't try to tell stuff which you it doesn't reflect you in your day-to-day -day interactions with other people. Just try to be a decent human being, and that they will figure it out pretty quickly. Just put it on the microphone. Yeah. Uh, so my uh, question is uh, related to the previous question related to change. Change uh, leads to a lot of uh, processes involving reskilling and redeployment. And uh, many companies have come up with innovative ways of uh, coming up with. Uh, learning and development in their respective companies. So would you like to share some uh, ex words of your experience in the l and section in terms of innovation? Absolutely. I'm happy to share that. So I think, uh, have you heard about 70, 20, 10 in any of your courses? Yes. So I, I think the 70% uh, organizations basically talk about you learn on the job. You learn when you're doing stuff. But it's underrated. It's assumed that people on their own will figure out a way to learn. We don't invest enough in that. In fact, as I move into my new role and I'm reshaping the whole LD agenda for the company, I want to put a structure around that 70. 
people need to really be provided some line of sight or insights along what are those skills or what are those capabilities which will stay relevant for a long period of time. So you don't take accountability of the 70 away from the employee, but at least show them a way that what is relevant. So I give you an example. Emerging markets for us, and I think one of these is an example, and I'm happy to share the context with you. Around, say, five or seven years back, so-called emerging markets, I think India, China, were called emerging markets when I joined this company, uh, almost six, six and a half years back. And the scale was not big. These were relatively small businesses, $300 million, $350 million businesses. <coughs> but experiences uh, were very different, different from, say, in Europe or a mature market like Europe or the US. Now, these businesses are as big as businesses in Europe or in the US. So India for us is a over a billion dollar business now, very successful. I was sharing with Anna, I feel so proud that India is our best performing market worldwide. It gets talked over every time. We emerged our quarterly results last night and CEO spoke about India. It's it's great to see that we are performing that level. China is one and a half billion dollar business for us. So they have the scale of that level. But they have complexity which is 10 times bigger than, say, a business in a mature market. So, I mean, a small example of India, around, I think, what, three years back when the demonetization happened, um, cash got sucked out of the economy. Ours is like plus impulse driven product. You know, you don't plan to buy a chocolate, you just see a chocolate, you buy one. So, people started rationing their cash outflow to India around more important things than a chocolate. So we had a massive impact. Now, nobody can anticipate this is going to happen in the business. And it will, I can tell you, in Europe, having lived and worked there, it, it's not going to happen just like that. One night, Prime Minister comes on the TV, and next day, <laughs> your million dollar business goes for a toss. It would never happen. So the role of the leaders become that more critical, that much more critical in, in markets like this. So people who react, very quickly to a situation like that and you can put in place and by the way one of the reasons today India is one of the best performing markets is because that demonetization happened. Because our leadership was very quickly able to reassess the new realities of the economy in India, come up with new products, refresh the portfolio, it's doing very well. So coming back to the experiences or the change Skills which are relevant are, to my mind, uh, emerging market skills. So your ability to react to situations which are unknown, you don't control, happen to you. How do you come across in those situations? And I come back to that 70, 20, 10. We want to put a structure that give people those experiences in a more deliberate way. Don't say that, okay, let people take accountability of what they want to do. So we are doing uh, experience mapping. Companies used to do career mapping, you have heard of. We are doing a, my team is actually working on doing an experience map. What are those experiences which will help people who are, we have Deepa career with the MD of India, become like Deepa, who would be well-rounded with the right level of exposure and experiences to respond to critical shifts or changes which are happening around them. So a big focus on providing critical experiences to people in our new l and strategy. We are also, uh, you know, there was also the sense of high potential training where you pick up your pipeline of leadership and you want to invest in them. We are also creating a much broader leadership agenda, which we call the right to enter Mondelez. So if you are a Mondelez employee, you have a right to become an effective leader. So we provide a much broader platform, which is a self-learning platform. <laughs> of course, leveraging technology and some tie-ups to give people opportunity. And then, then we want to go after a real, uh, you know, succession planning or bench planning driven investment behind our key talent to more deliberately manage their career experiences. So it's a, like a three pronged strategy, if I can say. Uh, my name is Alendra, uh, I'm from Marketing Co op. Uh, first of all, I, uh, we feel really, really loving to come here with such experience in quality leadership. It's really, really great. 
Um, so I have three questions for you today because as I have you, I don't want to miss this question. You get as much of this as I could. So the first question I'll start off with uh, <clears throat> is just uh, stating why you was uh, telling us to be really like uh, stuck with me at that point of time. You're saying that you were in a uh, uh, meeting with different HR leaders from different countries and they were like really disconnected and all to Zurich and they were looking at the beauty of the Switzerland. So I mean, uh, first question, I mean, how did you and cope up with that? Disconnect because I was like not I'm not being much experience, but I faced that disconnect in my life as well. So I just want that you know input with how I uh, feel uh, handle that situation. So my second question is, uh, as you being a leader yourself, and uh, you take uh, decisions gonna manipulate the whole system. So I mean, how does that enter into yourself, and how do you make yourself first of all believe? Because it's about you. You have been convinced to me and you, you will actually take that. And how do you convince yourself about taking those decisions to not affect I mean number of people? And the third and last question is you was talking about you know deliberate pipelining and you know, all those HR strategies which is gonna come up in the future. I mean it's easier said than done. And uh, people are getting engaged and everything is happening and you know someone as an employee is not you know motivated enough. So I mean, how as an HR, how was like you know, a mood of uplifter would happen to those people is that they kind of settle themselves up and they be in that place with everyone else. That you also. Okay, you have to remind me if I miss anything. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll try to pause. Three questions. So first of all, how did I feel in that moment? I felt mm -hmm. miserable. I actually cried. I went home. I sat with my mom, and I cried that I made a bad choice and. I actually felt miserable that I made a choice risking my family. I took a, a mom who was half paralyzed to, with me to Switzerland, a brand new place I'd walked through where people were going. We got inspired because a lot of this, you know, Yashka told me stories. We got inspired to rent a house or leave a house in a village, beautiful Swiss village. But we were the only non Swiss family in those eighty houses. So there was no social life for my wife or for my mom. And my wife uh, delivered a baby and I was traveling uh, probably 70, 80% of the time. So I really felt bad. I made a bad choice. I would sleep a couple, <laughs> couple of nights. And uh, yeah, I mean, I went through a very tough phase. When I hit the low, that's the time I went to Simon and I spoke to him that I would go back. And from there onwards, I started kind of lifting myself up. And I, I think one of my learnings is that it's all right actually to be disappointed. But be open to learn from that. We sometimes try to avoid disappointments. We don't want to go into a space that well, this, this could, uh, you know, could put me in an awkward situation. But as I said, I mean, if I would have gone through that journey, I would not be here where I am today. And I would have missed out on building the network of such beautiful people who give me so much energy even today. They're not part of my team anymore, I bought them. So yeah, that's that's the reality. I, I went through a very low phase, but I, I learned from it and I came out of it. Your second question was how do we make choice of the position? Uh, yes. So I, I think these are not, you know, you wake up and say, this is what I want to do. You've got to really make sure you have the right facts, right data, right insights, uh, both external and internal. So the choices, I mean, I was talking to you about we are making a transition to a workday platform. It is, it is going to touch 90,000 people across continents. They can go online, they can do their performance reviews online, they can, you know, give uh, increments, manager can decide how much salary changes they need to have, but they can do on their own, which they have never done. So this is a big empowerment decision, bigger than the technology decision in my mind. You're changing a mindset in an organization from controlling everything to letting go and trusting the organization. So is there a fear of failure? I mean, no, of course. I think any decision has the two sides, right? It can be successful or it can not be successful. But how do you manage the risk or how do you uh, de risk those decisions? Is make sure those decisions are fact based. You have the right insight. <coughs> I would go and check, I mean, that leadership development, I was just talking about that. I would talk to the entire leadership in the organization to seek their inputs in terms of what would that look like. So if I want to reset an agenda, it's not a 
one person's decision. It's a collective conversation with a lot of insights and inputs from business leaders to understand what is needed. How do we want to reset? Then we do external benchmarking. I go and attend forums where we <coughs> tell me, you know, the talent heads of different companies we meet. We talk, we make sure that I share what I need to share, but I am also seeking from them what has worked for them, what has not worked for them. Then I sit with my team and make sure big decision I'm talking about. So you make sure that you have the right insights, you have the right analytics, right data to guide your decision making. Of course, then you've done it a few times, you also get a little bit of it, you know comfort and experience that yes, this is the right thing to do. And I would also say be bold enough to change decisions. You don't stick and dig deep that this is what I decided, this is how it should be. If it is not working, stay close and make sure that you are able to maneuver a shape or change. Make, you know, ensure this going in the right direction. So that's that's the important. You have to remind me the third question. Third question is about um, uh, as we will go, of course, we'll pass out and go to uh, with, and that's where we'll go to with different companies and cross the organization. So, of course, we will not be on the same page, some of the very, very high end forms, very, you know, forms. And we talk about different changes in the environment as, as, as a perspective from HR that we're going to bring this, bring that. So, this is going to be like easier said than done. So, I mean, we can actually achieve that, you know, break that mind shape for people who are going to actually, you know, Stay on the same page because that can uh, affect the whole culture. Because if someone is really demotivated, we can see that and get influence. And now we get easier said than done. I think it's a great question. By the way, it's less about the, you know, the HR jargon, the competency, and all that stuff, which we, we like doing. But that's part of our kind of daily contribution. But I think um, I'm, by the way, working on that right now. So very fresh in my head. We just rolled out a new set of values for our organization. Value values and commitments. So uh, we have a new CEO who joined a year and a half back, and he came in and he wants to reset the whole organization. And organizations don't change their value system very often. I mean, they've been 15 years craft set up their values. And he gave me that challenge one year uh, last year when I moved into my new role that I want to reset this organization and I want to really anchor every employee into a set of values which they feel proud of. And he also said, don't come back to me with a set of competencies, which is an HR speak. Come back to me with a set of values, which from a shop floor to me, to me as a CEO of the company, we can relate to, I can connect to. So it was a very tough challenge. And I worked with my team over a period of time. On 11th of March, uh, we invited our top 250 leaders in Vienna. And we had one week with them where we rolled out our new values. And now that's been disseminated in the organization. Why I'm calling that out there is give people an anchor which they can connect with and believe in. Because day to day they'll be positive and negative. You know, we are all human beings, right? You go to office, there are good days and there are bad days. You have a bad conversation, you get a trigger, you get an email which is not you don't feel good about, and you feel sad when you come back. But if there are solid anchors which you believe in the organization and I, I go back to my Aisha days when you believe in the values of that organization then those day-to-day -day ups and downs you just go through you don't get stuck in that so my uh, you know counsel to those HR leaders or budding HR leaders in this room make sure you have the values which are lived every day by the people so people assess you it's not something you write on a wall or put a poster somewhere people will believe in it they will be judging you or validating those values every day in terms of how you come across. And when they find that connect, it's much more easier for you to engage with yeah. Who wants to go next? Uh, hello, sir. I'm Shalini. Uh, my question is that how companies are actually responding to 360 degree feedback? Because uh, there are a lot of dilemma if it's correct or if it's an evil. So, yeah. I think 360 is an effective tool, but it has its own limitations. Sir. I mean, there, there are positives to it. We also use it. Uh, it's it's a tool which which helps you to look at a person in a much more holistic way in that moment. At present, if you extend that tool, which I know organizations sometimes get into 
the track of looking at future derailers. So if you use it for a purpose for what it is not meant, then it starts becoming uh, probably an impediment in the growth and development of people. So 360 is a good tool to assess someone in that moment, how that individual is impacting around uh, in that environment. So your peers, your director boards, or your clients, all that. But keep it in the context and don't use it for purposes for what it is not meant. Any more questions here? Okay. Uh, my name is Ranthi Patel from HRIP Board. I wanted to, uh, as I have uh, heard that uh, you are associated with various uh, diverse, diverse organizations and you have worked in different countries. So, being a HR professional, what kind of challenges we are going we will be facing if we are, uh, we are thinking to go, move globally in terms of HR practices, please? Absolutely. I think um, first be open to learning because there is nothing which any education institute can teach you. The biggest education is what you look for and what your own level of understanding or curiosity is to go in and be open to learn. So my advice would be there is nothing different honestly I will work across the globe. It's about how much confidence you have in your own capabilities, how much willingness you have to learn something which you don't know. And to do that, that's a, you know, you have to basically drop your ego. Uh, you, have to, you, know, you have to become from somebody to nobody. And then when the doors open and you start learning, and then be bold enough to apply those learnings. Sometimes people learn and they feel a little bit afraid of, can I apply, it's a different environment, meaning environment, absolutely. Feel, feel good. You to experiment and you're willing to apply. And then I go back to the character piece, be a good human being because people like to work with you if you're nice. Nice and not kind of street nice, but a, a genuine human being who's there for helping others and setting them up for success. Yes. He has a fracture that, uh, in his leg, so therefore he won't stand, but he will sit and ask for Well, you will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, sir. Uh, yes. My name is Bala. Uh, I have a marketing over. So, uh, normally, uh, I don't want an HR related query, but it can be linked at least. So, normally, uh, when someone is getting recruited to an organization, not everybody will be aligned to the vision of it. So, when someone is not aligned to the vision of it and they're just there for the money, we are not able to uh, connect to them or get the maximum output out of them. As a manager, what should um, uh, a team leader or a manager do in just getting them on them? I think it's a great question, Bob. And I honestly feel it's okay sometimes to when you are entering the organization not to buy in from anyone. I mean, those things are not sustainable. I do feel that both employee and the organization have to suspend judgment for a bit. Both employee as, as well as the organization. So when you join a company, don't be in a hurry to make up your mind it's great or not great, this is good or this is bad. Just suspend that, just let it be what it is. And experience that environment before you have enough data points which make you feel that this is not the place where my personal value system connects with it. Right? I mean, the organization will tell you to do some funny stuff. You don't want to do that. That's fine. Then you make a decision, you move on. But if you walk in one day and you say, okay, they have painted their walls red and I don't like the color red, this is a bad company. Don't do that. Give it a time. Go with the flow. And same, I think, applies to the organizations too. Don't judge people from day one. I always, by the way, tell my own thing. People take their time to settle in. They take their time to understand, figure out. Some people bloom very late. Don't put labels and tags on them. This is the high potential. This is not. Let them find their own comfort their own rhythm in the organization and eventually they end up surprising you in a good way. So just have a big heart. Whatever company you join, don't judge from a day one.
Please give the microphone. Hello, sir. Uh, uh, my name is Garima. Uh, my question is uh, to understand uh, in the organizations right now, is the uh, role of manager changing a little bit? Uh, are, is HR uh, looking at managers to uh, engage employees? Uh, or what are, the, uh, what are some aspects that uh, we want to you know, kind of outsource to managers that team engagement is now yours or culture building is now yours? So what is that linkage between HR managers and companies? It's a very great question. So this language of managers changing pathway. We call them leaders. We say everybody's a leader. So when you go with a manager, you're managing something, you're going in a very restricted space. The, I can manage someone to do this job today. But I can engage and motivate them to do that job. But that's that's not sustainable. That's also tiring as a leader for you. As a manager, if you are really going day to day, trying to do this and trying to do that, and this is HR's job, this is finance job. But if you go there as a leader, who's there to help and enable others to be successful. And you set it up like that. So my job is, I've got, I don't know, 10 people in my team. I gotta make sure these 10 people show up every day at their best. They're in good form, they enjoy their journey, they learn every day, they get compensated well for what they do, get rewarded in the right way. That changes the game, that changes your way to approach them and how people look at you as a leader. So HR, I truly believe our job is not to run organizations. Our job is to enable leaders to be successful. So they, they can set up their teams for success. Uh, I was giving this example of the values launch. We didn't launch values through HR people running these programs in the factories or in the country. We called up 250 business leaders to be enough for a week. We provided them every tool. So first we got their file, first three days of that week. So we had them in a, in a very nice place, going through the journey with them to help them understand why these values are relevant for the organization and help them find their own personal connect to that. And then we backed off, we when I said I'm going to HR, me and my team, and we enabled these leaders with the tools to go out and be the face of the change which we want to see. So they are now rolling it out in the factories, in the countries and so on. So it's a cascade to 90,000 people led by business leaders, not HR anymore. And to me, actually, every business leader, sometimes people say, you know, is HR relevant anymore in the industry? I truly believe there's no other function which is as relevant as HR is because every, every leader is a human resource leader. Nobody, I mean, I look at my CEO who just sits across the you know, hallway from me. 80, 90% of his time, he's talking to people. He's working with others. He's making sure his people are putting in place the right strategies. He's able to push the agenda in the right way. So every business leader is a HR manager in my mind. And it's not about management, it's policy. Hello, sir. So uh, my name is Vicky. So you talked about that change, uh, that you sell a chain that you for 9,000 people. So I want to know that how do you carry such a big change and once it's implemented, how do you ensure that it's working? Great question. So I think one, you not to really have a strong execution plan. Sometimes you may have the best of the ideas and you don't know what to do with that. So you may execute it in a very mediocre way, you know, and I've been, I've seen that too. And you know, when you work in the organization, you learn what to do, but you also learn what not to do. I've had many experiences which taught me what not to do. Where, you know, in the corporate headquarters, I mean, I see one of the biggest advantage I carry of sitting in Chicago is I go from the factories, I go from a country, I go from a region, and now I go to a global. So when I think strategy, I also see how it is getting executed. And I can connect the dots. What would not work? If I create a leader, what would happen? Everybody would read it or understand it in their own way. And they may they will make a judgment. This is relevant for them. This is not relevant for India. This is not relevant for Korea. Well, Japan will figure out whether it works or not. And then a great idea dies a very slow death. It doesn't stick. So we make sure, by the way, talk to the people who are going to implement it, get them excited about the journey. So this example of Yena was sharing with you. We did, there was no need to pull in your country leadership teams for a week. 
or something like logic three values. But we felt if we don't do that, they, they are not convinced. It's not going to land well. So we made sure that they buy into it. We provided them the plan of what will help them to be the face of the change and implement it. And then we created tools, all the collaterals, the videos, all you know, your marketing folks in here, who helped us to build a very impressive plan with very simple things to land that change value. And then we monitor that change, make sure that my teams, which are spread across, are helping these leaders to land that change. So a big thing, I, kind of learning I want to leave with you is never just depend on the strategy. Look at the execution, the smallest stuff, the pieces of execution, and connect the dots. What may come in the way of a good strategy getting landed valid, and how do you fix it before it goes on for implementation? Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Bunji and I'm from Marketing Board. So my uh, question is, uh, sometimes we don't know uh, where we're going and we're not able to understand our work. Uh, but we find some interest. But then also we have a confusion that whether we should go or not. So uh, how we are able, able to uh, get to know where it is our goals and how we can go further? Great question, by the way. All of us go through that time. So, I don't have a kind of a templated answer. I will share with you, what are, if I put myself in your shoes, what are those thoughts, what are those ideas? <clears throat> I think one, make sure that you are creating, as I said earlier, you know, your portfolio of skill sets. What are the new skills you want to learn? And then lead in with a good intent. So, if you have not look at the final outcome, because you don't know what you don't know. And one, honestly, you can't define your own capabilities, what you tell me. Just make sure that you are building a set of portfolio skills which are relevant for future. I, I mean, I give you this example of me moving into the global talent role. I've never been a expert or, as we call it, center of expertise role ever in my career. I've been an HR journalist. I did a bit of everything. I did a bit of rewards. I did a bit of IR, employee relations, HR, all that. As a head of HR, this is a very specialist role. I'm not, you know, driving new organization structures, I'm driving new values, I'm driving new talent strategy, new learning development agenda on that. I never did it. But I do think that if I don't do this, I would never learn. And I did go through my own phase of change and discomfort as you go in there because you don't know what you don't know. And in organizations, when you move from one role to another, you start from a scratch. What you, what you leave your credibility behind, you start from zero and then you start building out. But you will never know that unless you try it. So go with a good intent, make sure you have the right skill sets, uh, portfolio of skill sets, which will help you find eventually what you want to do. And never put a boundary to this is what I can do and I can never do. You will surprise yourself, I can tell you. Atul, I'd like to ask you a question. Yes, sir. When you started your career in Aisha and you were in our plant in Parvana, you were paying some attention to leaders and what they were doing, not just what they were saying. What did you learn in the first part of your life at that time about leadership by observing the leaders whom you worked with and what kind of lessons you got at that time which have stayed with you over time? I think it's a great question, Ranil, and you articulated it really well. To my mind, one observation uh, and observing with intent to learn is different things. You know, we observe a lot of things in front of your past. But that goes like a movie. When you sit in a movie, you enjoy it for a bit, you come home, you move on to the next one. But if you're observing with intent, looking at leaders, it helps you to really uh, have that learning in your subconscious. So it comes automatically when you are, you actually start looking at people and see, well, how you want to be. I, think I, I, should, I mean, I, I said it earlier, I have a lot of, I'm, I'm fortunate I had a chance to start with an organization like I should at that time. I'm now out of lunch, it's been quite some time. But those were the days which uh, a lot of people, when I'll go even a step back, I mean, I was in the campus, I got interviewed by two or three different companies, and I, I was looking at choices, 
when I spoke to someone and they suggested that if you really want to pick up a company in HR, pick up Aisha. And I decided that I will, this is something I want to do. I mean, there are tough stories in my mind when I observe people really living the values uh, of what they did. So I would tell actually a story of it. Um, you would remember I was in Toto Box. Uh, it was a tough, very tough assignment. So I should have had a hand tools manufacturing unit, which I think we acquired from somebody. And it was uh, it was an opportunity. I was based in Parwan. My life was pretty good, I can tell you. My home is in Chandigarh. My brother was very well connected in Chandigarh in student politics and all that. So I was like, life is cool, I'll take a bus. I don't pay anything to my mom, my family was taking care of me and I was getting a nice salary in my pocket. So that was a life I wanted to live. Then I get an offer to move to this factory as an HR manager. So first independent HR manager job in a factory in Bivari. So you do you know Bivari? Yes. Tough place, I can tell you. I don't know how it is now. But it was a tough, tough place. It was a tough factory. It was not self-sustaining, I mean, if you remember at that time. We were struggling. Mr. Jinsi was, uh, I am Mr. Jinsi is associated here, right? Yes. Yes. You guys know Mr. Jinsi? Yeah. He was my boss. So we were going through a very tough phase in that plan. To the extent that we were not able to sustain through even pay wages to our people. And I I just got married that I moved with my wife to Gurgaon. We were living here. And I used to go to this factory. And there was a time we then, and it had a very aggressive uh, employee relations situation with the union and all that. We ran out of uh, we ran out of money to pay our workers. And I remember sitting with Mr. Jinsi and discussing how do we pay what employees? There will be a massive issue if we don't pay them. Their salaries and minus salaries. And that plot of that factory had a lot of uh, trees in that factory. The fact that we acquired. So I came out on it with this idea that we will cut the trees and we will sell the wood and we will pay our employees. And Mr. Jinsi, after a lot of discomfort, said this is not going to fly with Mr. Lal at that time. He had very strong affinity for environmental things. So I said, Well, we have no option if you don't get support from Aisha. We've got to pay these people. They gotta go home and make sure they're getting their you know two meals. And the salaries were not very high at that time. So we had uh, there were reviews of these businesses when the leadership team would visit. So Mr. B. Chatavedi, uh, SK Barga and Mr. Lal came to put up there was a business review. And I actually presented that plan, Mr. Lal that we want to cut these trees and we want to pay to our employees. And he stopped the meeting there. And he asked me to go out of the room. <laughs> and then he called Mr. Jinsi. And he said, how much money do you need? He never said, why did this guy is talking about cutting the trees? Or how the hell can he decide that he will cut the trees? He asked Mr. Jinsi, how much money do you need to make sure that this plant is sustained? Without doing what you guys are suggesting. And I was walking through that and I was scared, I can tell you, because I was asked to leave that meeting room. I didn't know what was conspiring. And I was worried that there's something going to drop upon me. And Mr. Lal came to me and he said, thank you. You were thinking of these 500 employees of this factory. And don't worry, we'll find a way to help them. Don't cut, please. And it stuck with me. I tell this story, by the way, in many places. That a good uh, leader will live up to what they stand for and they will make sure they become examples for you. So it was very easy. He was a, a promoter of the company. He could have very easily kicked me out, made a decision which was a difficult decision. He come and came and appreciated to me what I did without compromising what he stood for. And those are values. I mean, this is one example. I probably saw 10 examples every month of those behaviors in our leaders. Uh, I remember I was going with you to your sister's house in Chandimandi. You remember that? Yes. You were visiting the factory. I was a junior guy. I mean, he was like a god for us. He was the head of HR for the company. I was the IR officer. 
We were driving back from Taiwan and I still remember that. And I was very quiet. I didn't know what to say to you on a lot, or how to engage in a conversation with you in that car. And when you said, come, I'll we'll pass by. My sister is here in Chandi Mandir. I think her husband was posted. And we'll spend some time and we'll go home. And I was like, okay. I mean, I, I couldn't say anything. And then he took me there. You introduced me to your sister, your brother-in-law. He sat there. They made me feel comfortable that I was a real important person. I was not, you know, one flunky falling <laughs> Adil back from the factory to Chandigarh. And I think those are things which you learn. And it goes into your subconscious. You know, how you want to be as you grow up uh, and become leaders. What is important to you? And to me, that's why I feel your first jobs are very important jobs, guys. Make sure those are investments you are making for your future. Because it, your career is like a business. You invest, you consolidate, <laughs> and then you reap the benefits. So if you are not investing or building your foundation in the right way, and then you're not consolidating those experiences, your latter part of the journey is not that comfortable. So if your first set is solid, you're learning and consolidating, then you can have fun as you grow up. Who would like to ask the next question? So you can keep doing this Facebook Live. Uh, just keep holding it and looking at him with here. Don't put your hand in front of the camera. You are Facebook Live, by the way. Okay. And uh, you know, many of our ex Aisha people are online okay. watching you. So I just want to say to Atul that, uh, you know, it's been such a wonderful uh, occasion to have him back uh, here. I say back because other people are always here, and, you know, so I think there are five things I want us to remember out of his conversation today and uh, what I can from him. One, he said that most important thing in life is to be a nice human being. He said nice human being is about being very genuine, not trying to be like someone else. He simplified what a nice person is, that you really, if you connected with people and you are genuine with them and you spend time and get to discover them as people, that's the most important aspect in life because then all the facade of trying to impress each other is over. And part of being another fellow human being, irrespective of your title, is to say I don't know. And I want to learn with you. So people work with me, they don't work for me, they work with me. He said that. The second thing he said is that whenever you are into a completely new situation and you, for example, he accepted this assignment in Switzerland because he had this kind of uh, very romantic idea of Switzerland and I'll take my wife and mother into this beautiful country, one of the happiest countries in the world and so on. But as soon as he reached there, he found that perhaps he had done a mistake because there was no social life for his mother and his wife. And at work, he was very uncomfortable. But even though the first tendency was flight away, he was having the humility to listen to his colleague who said to him, yes, if you like, we can arrange for you to go back to your familiar place. But how do you take responsibility for what you are facing today? And what would you like to learn out of that situation? So, when you are completely out of your comfort zone, that's when you actually begin to grow. So that's the second thing he said. The third thing he said, as far as organizations are concerned, they are changing all the time. They, become, they are becoming far more agile, far more responsive to change. So never apply to a company with some position in mind and some role in mind. Because the day you join from campus, you may have been recruited for one role. But the day you join, your role will be completely changed. Always join an organization, not a particular job or a particular role. He also mentioned that do not be fixed in your mind to say that the linear relationship or here is how I will grow. 
we are for the experience and he said that you know really be curious be flexible adapt yourself show that hunger that i want to learn and i want to make a difference then many things will happen he also mentioned that in the whole field of human resources this thing about just looking at a set of competencies is not what life is all about but there are just some he used the beautiful word capacity capacity is for example your capacity to learn is about how do you take responsibility for your own learning capacity to think how do you actually make the right choices capacity to relate how do you relate to people across not just people who go so called matter and capacity for action he said when he arranged the whole values refurbishment or recreation in an established company when you are creating new values the conversation was get all the right to people around the right questions 250 people in vienna from all over the world to have a conversation about the intention of how are we going to build this culture and lastly he said something very interesting to you he said you know what the role of hr is to actually work yourself outside out of your own job in a way that every person as a human resource leader you have to celebrate their success you have to enable them to get the best out of your out of the people and not say we have done it and i think these are some, there are many other things that he said but i was paying paying attention to some of these things that he said today which are such remarkable learning so please join me in giving an extreme a really big hand Like to say something, and before you give a little moment of love and affection. Good evening, sir. First of all, it's a pleasure to have you here. And more importantly, uh, your work with sir, so you also share our experience with how you work with sir. And uh, and and despite all that, uh, you share your experiences from your own personal life and professional life, which how to create a balance and how to. Uh, Maintain that in uh, in the real world. We just spoke about how the world is changing, how the companies are changing. Something which we all are looking forward to. So really, thank you for your insights, and uh, we hope we uh, we do well, and uh, we hope to have you in our office as well. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I just want to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity. Great questions, by the way. It was a great conversation. Uh, I'm uh, although I didn't study here, but I'm part of this organization. I will always be available. Uh, physically here, or even remote, I did address or discuss or got into some kind of conversation with one class here. But leverage me or use me, whichever way you can. I'm part of this uh, this journey. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.